Well, good morning, boys and girls. Welcome back from uh, your winter break. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you are well rested. Um, like that. I hope you're well anxious to get back to hear how our, our friend Pierre is doing here. Let's take a look <clears throat> and see what's going on. So we got chapter nine, which is called a long day's paddle. The brigade was up again at 4 a.m. And with the long Sioux behind them, the voyageurs were in great spirits. Remember, a Sioux, boys and girls, is a, uh, a bunch of rapids um, that they are unable to really go down or up. Okay, the fast-moving water. Technically, the company wants them to portage or get out, go to shore, Paddle their canoes to shore, unload, and then haul the canoes around is what they like them to do. Or they can do what's called poling. They can go ahead and tie ropes around the canoe and have people on the shore pull, pull the canoe upstream. So, a lot of different ways to do this, but it's no fun. So the long sues behind them, and the voyageurs were in great spirits. And while Mr. McKay was... Still in his tent, getting dressed, Lalonde grinned and said, Watch this. Pierre's eyes widened as Lalonde sneaked behind McKay's tent, and he released the support poles. To everyone's delight, the tent collapsed. Unbothered, McKay crawled out of the door opening, and he stood with his pants at half-mast. Pulling his suspenders up, he eyed the likely culprit. Hey, top of the morning, you gentlemen! The big Scotsman said, making no effort to hide his grin. It cheers my heart to see ye all so anxious to get under way. That we are, Lalonde replied. And awaiting your good guidance. With that, they all had a good laugh, and Pierre chuckled until his belly felt warm. This pros the prospect of a day-long paddle was frightening. But the good humor of the morning relaxed him, and as they started up river, La Petite and Lalonde led the men in, in song. Old French sea chants, folk songs, and silly rhymes echoed up and down the river as Pierre dug in with his paddle. The sun warmed Pierre's shoulders as it rose, illuminating the left-hand shore finally, and finally the river. Thin trails of mist lifted off the water. Birds rustled through the dry leaves in a near bank. A stilt-legged heron stalked his breakfast in a reed bed. Pierre tried to follow his bowsman's advice. He sang along with the men. He studied the stately pines and the distant ridges. He imagined where the blue Ottawa would eventually lead them. But his hands were still thro still throbbed, forgetting the effort of paddling by losing himself to other thoughts that sounded simple, but his hands were so puffed and swollen they felt as if chunks of skin were pulling loose from them. Remember, boys and girls, <clears throat> the advice Pierre was given to think of something else besides the paddling. Take your mind off your work. And right now, his work is paddling, and the paddling is causing his hands to be in rough shape. He thought about school, imagining Celeste in her seat by the window. He saw the morning sun shining on her silky black hair and her blue eye, blue dress, patterned with tiny white flowers. About now, Sister Marguerite was standing before the class saying, Take your places now, children. Closing his eyes for an instant, Pierre could smell the chalk dust and the freshly oiled maple floor. And the damp winter clothing drying in the line behind the stove. He could hear his sister reading her favorite Bible verse. Lay not 
for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves. But when the brigade stopped for a breakfast, Lalonde checked on Pierre's hands. So how's the paws holding up today? He asked, reaching out to inspect a hand. Woo, he whistled. whistled. <whistles> Studying the oozing blisters. Looks like you've been leaning on a hot griddle. These are almost as bad as mine were on my first trip out. My hands blistered up and bled so bad that I whined constantly. The fellows threatened to throw me in for fish bait, Lalon laughed. Let me show you a little trick. While breakfast was cooking, the bowsman took some deer hide strap strips out of his pack. It's doe skin, the softest stuff you could ever find, he said. Then he took Pierre's paddle and he wrapped the handle with several turns. There, that should help. What's this? Belois interrupted. Does our puppy need padding for his little hands? Pierre looked away, but the ugly man stepped closer and examined a newly wrapped paddle. If I'd only known, he continued in mock concern, my mother has some pretty silk gloves she could have loaned. Lalande cut him off, saying, Stick your ugly puss in somebody else's business. As Belois walked off cackling, Lalande said, Consider the source. Don't let him get to you. But Pierre hated Jean Belois more and more every day. He stared after him. If only he could crack the crude fellow over the head with a paddle. One hard swing was all he wanted. Pierre smiled to himself as he imagined the cedar blade splintering over the brute's head. He was sure the other crewmen would cheer, and even if Belois stabbed him in the heart, Pierre would die with content. The paddle handled helped, but the pain was still severe. Shortly after breakfast, it began to rain, and Pierre pulled his cap over his ears and hunched down. But the other men all pulled their shirts off and stuffed them under the oilcloth tarp that protected the freight. Steam rose off the naked shoulders of the crew. Pierre watched the rain beat up on dark-skinned Emile, who was sitting directly in front of him. As the rain increased, water cursed down his back. Charbonneau leaned towards Pierre, saying, If it wasn't too late, I'd tell you to shed your clothing. What good would that do? Pierre asked. You'll see shortly, Emile said. Turning, his expression made Pierre nervous, for though Emile had only been in brigades for two years, he knew a lot about the voyageur life. And a short while later, Pierre understood Emile's grin. Though the other men paddled freely, his soaked shirt made it hard for him to lift his arms. The heavy fabric clung to his shoulders, and his collar channeled a river down his back and into his pants. Soon, he began to itch. He twisted on his seat between paddle strokes, and Charbonnel chuckled. What's the trouble, monsieur? He asked. Have you wet your breeches, perhaps? When the sun came out, the other men put their shirts back on. But Pierre took his off and draped it over the gunwale to dry. The fly swarmed over him. One bit him in the shoulder, and two more left big welts on the middle of his back. You must have sweet blood, Charbonneau remarked. The flies sting like they found the honey pot. Though it didn't make sense, the pain of the bites of his bites made him forget the pain of his paddling. He didn't even know what had happened until their next rest stop. Pierre put his hand on the gunwale and it got a jolt of pain. The blisters were raw, but he couldn't remember when he last felt them. Could those old-timers be right after all? Pierre wondered as he stepped onto the beach. While the crewmen lit their pipes and rested, Pierre stretched his legs and studied his swollen hands. <laughs>